All right, who's ready for the word? Oh, only 10 of y'all. We got, we got a little more than 10 here. Who's ready for the word? All right, amen, amen. Uh, so here's, here's my disclaimer again. Uh, we go through books of the Bible verse by verse. What that means is we don't skip we, we, we believe all of the Word of God is the Word of God. So the topic again, so Paul, we, we took a little break. We talked about sex in chapter 5, verses 1 uh, through 13, and then we talked about court in the beginning part of chapter 6. Well, he's talking about sex again. So guess what I'm talking about? Because it's the Bible. So we shouldn't be ashamed of it. So that's the topic. That's my disclaimer for parents. And we're talking about sex again next week because he talks about sex and marriage. That's my last disclaimer. I don't want to have to do a disclaimer every week. But, but we, again, we, I do want to be sensitive. I am a parent, but I just want to give you that heads up. So the, the, the text deals with sex. So Pastor Jerome needs to, to deal with what the text is dealing with this week, today, and next week. So that's, that's your warning if you need a warning. And so let's read. I'm reading from the CSB version of Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning at verse 12. If you got it, say, I got it. Oh, man, y'all ready. All right, we're going to read out loud together, reading from the CSB version of Scripture. This is the Word of God. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will do away with both of them. However, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Don't you know that your bodies are part of Christ's body? So should I take a part of Christ's body and make it a part of a prostitute? Absolutely not. Don't you know that anyone joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For Scripture says the two will become one flesh. But anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Here's his, here's his advice. Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. Join me in prayer. Gracious God, we are so grateful and thankful for this time in your word. We ask now that you would speak and you would remove me out the way, that I'd be faithful to preaching the inerrant word of God. Let me handle it with care. But let me also preach with conviction and power and grace and compassion. And let us hear eager to see how we can live out the verse, God. I pray against any resistance to your word of God. But I also pray that we can explain for those that are on the fence about faith who don't believe, Father. We were all doubters at one point, but you lovingly drew us to yourself. And so now... God, let me preach under the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit. Bless this time. Speak to your people. Speak through me as a willing vessel. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I, I want to say this quote that I think is profound, and it says this, When the purpose of something or someone is misunderstood, abuse is inevitable. Let me say that again. When the purpose of something or someone is misunderstood, abuse is inevitable. If you don't know the, pers uh, the purpose of something, you will misuse and you will abuse it. Uh, I have a hammer here, and this, this hammer uh, can be used to build and construct a beautiful edifice like a church. Uh, if you remember the uh, home makeover show, and they would say, move that move that truck or move that bus. There was this beautifully renovated home, and, and when you saw them building the home, they would use a hammer. We don't know all the details of what Noah had, but I would imagine he had something similar to a hammer in order to build an ark. Here's the thing. I can use this hammer to build, or I could use it to beat. 
I could use this to build a beautiful edifice, or I could use it to bludgeon someone, to hurt someone, to commit a heinous act against someone. That does not make the hammer wrong. That makes the person who doesn't understand the purpose of the hammer wrong. So, so what Paul says is in, in the same way, the hammer, the, the design, the purpose of this is to build, is to hammer a nail into wood or to something else so that fixtures can be constructed and things can stay together. But I could take this same thing and misuse it. And if I misuse it, I would be abusing it. Because if I don't understand the purpose, I will misuse and I will abuse. And what if I, if I, what if I were to tell you that your body has a purpose? That's what Paul is getting at today, that, that your body has a purpose. Listen, every aspect of your body, e- even the parts that, that look different or don't function the same as you get older, every aspect of your being, your body has a purpose, and God wants to use it for his glory. But our, our culture does not understand that. In fact, we think that our bodies are ours, and I'm not making a political statement here, but, but the phrase that defines our culture is, my body, my choice. But that's not the Christian view. The Christian view is my body, his temple. Amen. That, that my, my body is not my own. My body is not my own. I've been brought with a price that he's going to say later, so we should honor God with our body. Uh, the way our culture views the body and sex is most clearly seen. And look, look at these are some of the words we use to describe sexual intercourse. Smashing. Body count. I Meaning how, peop- how many people you slept with. Side piece. Uh, she, she's not a human being. She's a side piece. So, someone I just use for my sexual exploits. Uh, if, if you watch Being Mary Jane, Gabrielle Union's show, she had a man who was her cuddy buddy. Real quiet. Uh, her cuddy buddy, someone she just used for sex. Jump off. To describe what you do when you're done, but also how you see the other person. Friends with benefits. Few more words, but the same perversion. Hook up. This is kind of old, but still used. Booty call. And, and, and this is how we get to the bed. But here's the phrase, slide in the what? Only 10 of y'all act like y'all know what I'm I know we got all ages, so some people legitimately didn't know, but a few of y'all knew what I was talking about. Now, now Paul is going to tell us that our our bodies have a purpose and in order to keep us from abusing them. Because here's the thing about sexual sin leads to physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual sabotage, and it keeps us in a state of brokenness. Listen, it doesn't mean it doesn't feel good while you're doing it, but it has an aftertaste that you can't prepare for. Sin always, it's, it's the, the preview. The preview looks great, but the whole movie sucks. The, the preview is nice, and it gets you to spend that ticket, but then you regret it afterwards. And so he's trying to protect us, and he, here's what I want you to understand. Because what, what I'm going to say today, I'm, I'm coming to your neighborhood if you are in this, but here's what I want you to do. You need to understand the heart and the tenor of what I'm preaching and the heart and the tenor of God. Yes, I am confronting you. But God's heart is to, when he confronts you, it's not to condemn, but it's to convince you that God's way is better. He, he, he's never coming. So, yes, you will be confronted, but not to condemn, but to convince you that God's way is better. That despite what our culture says, and it seems free, and it seems fun, God wants to convince you that his way is better. See, when something designed by God, sex is God's idea. Sex is God's invention. No, it's not nasty. No, we should not be afraid to talk about it. We shouldn't get all funny when we talk about it in church. In fact, listen to me, parents. We, the, the, the studies are showing, this was a 2011 study, said that, that most children by age 10 have already done it. Yes, even those in Christian schools. So, so we got to, just because they, yeah, they're in a private school, guess what? They're hearing about it. Because you don't know the sexual story of the students that they're in class with. And so I'm not telling you how to parent, but I am telling you they're going to hear from somewhere, so they need to hear it here, and they need to hear it from you. They, they need to hear it in this setting. We need to talk about it. And the ages are getting younger and younger because they have access with these phones. 
They can go on Instagram and see a woman twerking, see somebody doing something with just a couple of clicks. Don't Google twerking if you don't know what it is. Just, just trust me, okay? If you don't know what that means, just we, you are right. You can stay under the rock on that one. Amen? Okay? But, but, but when we don't understand, when, when something God designed is within a covenant commitment is done outside of his design and purpose, various forms of abuse and turmoil is the consequence. Ch- check out what, what, what Solomon says in Proverbs 5. It says, uh, verse 3 through 6, and then 8 and 10, says, Though the lips of the forbidden woman drip honey, and her words are smoother than oil. So h- here it is. We call that talk game. So he or she, because let, let's be careful not to make women the face of lust because it's a man and a woman in this text that's being addressed. So, so he or she has talk game. It drips, honey. They, they know what to say. Anybody, anybody heard some good talk game? They, they know what to say. It drips, honey. Her words are smoother than oil. But verse 4, in the end, she's as bitter as warm wood and as sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps head straight for Sheol, she doesn't consider the path of life. She doesn't know her ways are unstable. So here's a, her talk game is good, but listen to me. The consequences always last longer than the pleasure. The consequences always last longer than the act. However long they last in bed, the consequences are always longer. And these are some of the consequences. Flashbacks. Some of you, you have flashbacks from past lovers, flashbacks because you viewed pornography, sexual comparison. You you begin to compare. If you had more than one partner or things you've seen, you're comparing people in bed. Some of us, some of you struggle with porn and you're comparing your spouse. Sexual addiction. You, You feel like you can't stop. You feel like you can't control this. Sexual experimentation. Broken families. See, as a pastor, I have to deal with the consequence of your action when I have to sit with a child about why he chose this side piece over his wife. See, that's what I have to deal with. The son or the daughter confused by the adult's action. Wasted emotional and sexual vitality. The other consequence is feeling unwanted. Two weeks ago, I showed you a video from Red Table Talk where they were talking about the rise of polyamory, where, where people are openly dating and having sexual intercourse with multiple people. Everyone knows and everyone's cool, cool with that. Uh, the Greek word for that is nasty. <laughs> My bad, nasteo. Right? Now, now he, he, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's, here's, here's what I believe. Now, I, I, I'm bringing some levity to it, but, but I, I do recognize the brokenness in the people because here's what I think. Here's what I think one of the causes of this is. I believe that the person has been hurt so much that they've said, I'd rather beat the person to the punch and let me just be open since you're going to end up cheating on me anyway. What if because they feel so unwanted, it's easier to just say I'm polyamorous in order to not feel hurt again. These are the consequences. Are you hearing me? And so the aforementioned, uh, these are all examples of flashbacks, sexual comparison, sex addiction, sexual experimentation. These are all examples of what we would call a sexual stronghold. Say stronghold. Now listen, a sexual stronghold is a value system or mindset that hinders your ability to understand, experience, and enjoy God's purpose, listen, for your body and sex. What a stronghold does is it clouds your judgment and you begin to make dysfunction normal. And when a a person, listen, when a person refuses to deny themselves, They feel like they have the inability to control themselves. And so when they feel it, they look at, they look, they look at who, they they look up, and they become a slave. So here's our thought tattoo family. If I don't master my desires, my desires will master me. If I don't master my desires, my desires will master me. But here's the thing: you don't have to live like this. Family, I'm very transparent about my story. 
I was addicted to porn, and I did not think I would ever break free. By the third year of our marriage, I watched it, and it took me years to, listen, years, once again, years to break free from it. And I did not think, because I would make it three weeks, and then I would watch again. I would make it three months, and then I would watch again. I would make it six months, and every time I watched, I felt like I had to start all over again. Like, man, I got to start off. And I'm counting days, and then I finally realized I, I, that the issue is not just the desire. The only way I can conquer this is by a greater desire. I, God, help me to desire you more than this so that I can tell myself no. Because if I don't master my desires, what? My desires will master me. Let's read 1 Corinthians 6, 12. Everything, Paul says, is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will do away with them both. However, the body is not for sexual morality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Here's our first point. I must discern the difference between desires that are developmental and desires that are destructive. Listen to me. I must discern the difference between desires that are developmental and desires that are destructive. Now, Paul says everything is permissible for me. Here's what he's saying. I can do what I want. This is, listen, this is the ancient version of pursue your truth. See, these little quotes, nothing new. It's not new. They said the same thing a different way. This is their version of pursue your truth. Do, do, do you. This is our do you culture. Do you relationally. Do you sexually. Do, do what makes you feel good because we think that God exists for our happiness. God does not exist for our happiness. We exist for his glory. We exist for him. He doesn't exist for us. And so be, because of that, he says, everything is permissible. In other words, I can do what I want to do. But just because I can doesn't mean I should. Please, that's one of the, we're calling this adulting. That's one of the first things you need to recognize if you're going to grow up. Adults understand that I can do what I want to do, but that don't mean I should. Adults understand that I have to tell myself no. Adults understand, listen, that not every desire I have is good or constructive. Listen to me. He's making a larger point here. The bigger point Paul is making is he has the ability and the power to deny himself. That's why he ends by saying, I won't be mastered by anything. Yes, I have desires, Paul says. Yes, I can do what I want to. But everything I can do doesn't mean that I should do. And that all of my desires are constructive. And again, this isn't popular in our do you culture to say no to ourselves. Our desires can't always be trusted. Listen to me. Desires are real. They're not always right. You can have a coworker who is attractive, who's funny, who has a nice smile, who has a great personality, and you can desire to want more than a friendship with them. You need to deny that because you're married. You have a desire that you need to deny. And let me say this because we, we, we talked about homosexuality, and the, the misnomer is that uh, Christians, you're bigoted because you're telling me to deny myself. You're telling me to deny something I feel. You're telling me to deny someone whom I love. Listen, heterosexuals got to deny themselves too. Jesus says the, the prerequisite of being his disciple in Matthew 16, 24, if any man or woman will be my disciple, he must first what? Deny himself. He didn't say only the homosexual did I know. Everyone must deny them. Heterosexuals need to deny themselves too. Homosexuals, you're not being picked on as it relates to denial. All of us need to be willing to say no to the person in the mirror. This is what Paul is saying, saying here. So Paul says he won't be mastered by anything. He's able to discern the difference between destructive and developmental, developmental desires. Listen, a developmental desire is one that enhances your walk with Christ. This is why he's going to tell us later in chapter 15, look, bad company corrupts good character. 
So, so make sure the atmosphere you're, you know, and not that we shouldn't be around. He told us in chapter 5, listen, I'm not telling you to uh, get away from all sexual morality. I- I'm telling you not to indulge in it. But if you tried to get away from it, you would have to leave the whole world, Paul said. Paul said that back then. You know what that means? They was getting it in back then. They didn't have cameras and Instagram accounts. They didn't have twerk challenges. They didn't have the ways to celebrate perversion, but it was the same perversion. So he said, look, man, if, you, if you're trying to get away from sexual morality, he said, you're going to have to leave the globe. That's what Paul said. He said, you have to leave the world. So I ain't saying that, but he said, for the church, for those who claim Christianity as their theological home, for you, you got a standard. Because if there's no difference in your lifestyle, why should I trust your God? That's what he understands how the world will view it. Are you with me? So, so he's saying he's no longer mastered by it. He, he's no longer mastered by this. So here's the point. The Christian does, should never have to say, I couldn't help myself. That's, that's not true. And please don't say this one. The devil made me do it. It's in those moments I pray for a slap ministry. Do not say the devil didn't make you do anything because now you're saying he's your Lord. That's what that phrase is saying. Here's here's what Paul says to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians 5.18, and don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, why would Paul compare being Spirit-filled with being drunk? Because, you know, when you're drunk, your inhibitions are removed. You're out of control. Secrets (laughs) Secrets <laughs> come out when someone's drunk. The inhibitions are removed. But he's, he's, he's making a correlation. He said, all right, when you're drunk, you're out of control. When you're spirit-filled, you're in control. So don't be drunk with wine where you're out of control. Be filled with the spirit where you're in control. So where uh, the, the liquor removes your inhibitions, the spirit removes your fear. So now you're in control, and you can tell yourself no, and you can tell that person with that nice body, that nice smile, those white teeth, those abs, those dimples, no. Are are you hearing me? Whatever your picture is of sexiness, attractiveness, God says through the Spirit, you have the ability to say no. Because this is what he says. So he says that to the church at Ephesus, the church at Galatia. What does he give us? The fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. Uh Uh-oh, number nine, self-control. Oh, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up. Self-control. I can't help myself. Self-control. The ninth one, self-control. The ability to say no to me. And some of you had no problem telling everybody else no. But can you say no to the person in the mirror? Here's the point, fam. Listen to me. You and I can overcome sexual strongholds. We can overcome them through the power of the Spirit. So there there are two Greek words here that Paul uses for master or, or power. Power is used in two different ways. One is dunamis. Dunamis is going to be the next verse. Dunamis is power, the ability. Think of it this way. We we put it in a sports realm. Uh, Dunamis is the power of somebody to jump real high and dunk, the the power to run over another human being, the power to run through three men and still score the touchdown. It's that power. But that's not the power he's saying. He's saying, I won't be mastered. That's the Greek word exousia. Exousia, think of this. If dunamis is the power of the NBA player, exousia is the referee. So what Paul is saying, no, I will not be mastered. I will not have a referee that is not from God govern how I play this game called life. So he said, I won't be exousia. I will not be mastered by my desires. I won't be mastered by my urges. I won't be mastered by any master other than the creator. That's what he's saying. That's why he uses this Corinthian colloquialism. Then he goes on, because I I know reading it in English, it seems like, okay, he's talking about Section Mariah, then he say, food for the stomach, stomach for food. Like when I read the Bible, I ask questions. It was like, Paul, what, what are you talking about? Like, wouldn't a ham sandwich just happen? How you go from that to food? Well, that's a, that was a Corinthian colloquialism where essentially this, and again, I just want to be very lovingly direct. They viewed sex as no different than your appetite. So when you're hungry, you eat. 
excuse me, when you're horny, you, that was their value system. When you're hungry, you eat. When you're horny, go have sex. And he says, so now watch what Paul does. Christian, please learn from this. He takes the quote that they're familiar with. He adapts it to give them a kingdom perspective. So we can take Meg the Stallion's quote and say, no, this is how we're supposed to view it. So he takes the quote, food for the stomach, and he says, no, 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 no. Let me bring this back to a kingdom perspective because it's not my body, my choice. It's my body, his temple, which he's going to end the chapter saying. So he uses the poets and the quotes of his day not to affirm, but to adapt. That's what Christians do. We bring a kingdom, but we're, we're not so holier than thou that, oh, my God, you listen to this. or you No, no, we expect that from the world. That's what he said in the last chapter. Like, why, why are you shocked when they do this, when they post this? Why, why are you shocked? Why are you offended? They're not, in, they're not a part of this family yet. So we're supposed to go where they are, show them the love of Christ, the grace of Christ, but also let them know that grace is never a license to sin. Grace is a reason for transformation. So this, is, this, is what, this is what he does. It's brilliant. I, lo- I love this. So they, that's how they viewed sex. And, 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 and sex and food were the same thing. Now, listen. Not much has changed. Some men still think that if he buys a woman a meal, he deserves. See the correlation, food and sex? Not much has changed. Not not, not much has changed. And so what Paul wants to do is he wants to free them, listen, from being voluntary sex slaves. Now, here's the thing. This type of sex sex slavery is self-inflicted. Because if you can't deny yourself, you are a sex slave. He's saying, you can't tell yourself, no, in this area, you're a slave to your desires. So he, again, he reminds them of the biblical sexual ethic we talked about in chapter 5. Now, let me give you the components of the biblical sexual ethic. Number one, it's God honoring. That means it's holistic. It's not compartmentalized. That's why God wants you to experience it in a covenantal relationship. Number two, it's time-sensitive. Song of Solomon says, do not awaken or stir up love until it desires. God is love, so don't awaken up these sexual desires and act on them until it's time so you don't have to worry about if the person's going to call you the next day. It's gender specific. It's between a man and a woman. We, we want to lo- lovingly engage our homosexual brothers and sisters, but we stand on a biblical sexual ethic. We do not compromise what the Word says. No, number four, it's commitment-oriented. It should be in a covenantal marriage. Number five, it's pleasurable. I don't understand why people don't say amen to that part. I mean, for real. Like, it's, it's supposed to feel good. And it's okay to say that. That was another cue to say amen. It, it, it is okay. It's supposed to feel good. You're supposed to. I'm, I told him, I'm talking about this next week. He says you need to do it often. In chapter 7. In the later part in chapter 5, he says, the husband, you should be captivated by your wife's body. Not some other woman, your wife's. Then it says, let her breast satisfy you at all times. You missed another cue to say amen. (laughs) This is not, this is the word. I mean, I'm, I'm not apologizing. You don't send me no email. I'm in the book. I'm in the book. I will not read it. Number six, frequent. Oh, t- <laughs> How come it was a man? I was the none of the so frequent. Amen, brother. Amen. Verse 14 says, God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Don't you know that your bodies are part of Christ's body? So should I take part of Christ's body and make it a part of a prostitute? Absolutely not. Don't you know that anyone joined to a prostitute is one with her? For Scripture says the two shall become one flesh, but anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Here's our next point. Listen, sexual oneness is designed to be experienced after spiritual oneness. You hear me? So let, let me show you God's order. I want, I want you to see this image. God's order is spirit, soul, then body. 
You hear me? God's order is spirit, soul. Do we have that one? Put that on the screen. Spirit, soul, then body. In other words, there should be an agreement on how we view eternity. You see this? There should be an agreement on, listen, before we get here. Now, listen, we're going to get here. Amen? But we need to be here first. Why would you compromise with someone who views eternity different than you? So he says, before we consummate this, and he wants you to consummate it, there should be a one and so spirit, then souls. That's games. That's like just because you have something in common doesn't mean that you should sleep with them. Just because y'all like pizza don't mean y'all soulmates. <laughs> so it's spirit, soul, then guess what? I had to find something PG for y'all, body. We, ain't, we, gonna, we, we, we love the Lord, amen, so we're going to use pictures that people can handle. But, but it didn't end there, amen. So, spirit, we agree that Jesus is Lord, that there's one way. So, there should be a period of us understanding our likes and our dislikes. Then body, after we've established that we agree on eternity, now we can consummate our bodies together frequently, pleasurably, and we should be naked and unashamed. We can learn. We can grow together. I can learn your sexual likes. You can learn my sexual likes within a covenant of marriage. I'm not worried about, is he going to call me tomorrow? Is she this? Was I, did I last long enough? Did, see, see all, that, that stuff happens. Outside of a commitment. In a commitment, you grow together. Guess what? You should get better over time. Chapter 7. But when you just do it and they put everything on that, on that one night. Because here's what happens. Here's what the world is teaching us to do. To audition for affection. So I got to perform. I got I to, gotta, ladies are taught to audition I'm not going to be too vulgar, but they, oh, you got to do this to him, girl. You got to do this. You, you, you got to do this. And such and such, Cardi B said this. Please don't let Cardi B be your role model. Amen. Bless God. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. Uh, but you, we, 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 we must have a standard. Men, don't let Migos be your role model. Again, we're not going to pick on genders. Like the, the, we, we need to understand as a standard. Spirit, so come on, say, say spirit, soul, then body. One more time, spirit, soul, then body. See, here's what happens. When you do this, when you, re- can you put the image back up? When you reverse it, the world's order is body, soul, then spirit. That's the world. So the world says, what does he look like? What does she look like? Does she have my dimensions? Is he packing? Is she this? Okay. Now I'll see if I like him. I just want you to see how foolish this is, but we should be grieved. So I didn't give him or her my body, but I'm not sure how I feel about him. He go to church sometimes. Are y'all with me this morning? I love y'all. Amen. All right. Listen, God never views sex as a hookup, even if our culture does. God never views it. See, when you go body, soul, then spirit, what you're saying is, I only want part of you. I only want the parts of you that make me feel good. I don't want to be one with you spiritually, mentally, emotionally, financially, and then I don't want to be physically outside of the act of having sex with you, but when I want to go, I want to go. Guess what? That's abuse. When you allow a man or a woman to do that to you, when you allow them, when you allow them to bookmark your life and to go live their life, then all of a sudden inbox you and one, you are holding yourself in a particular place for them to be ready for you. You are abusing yourself and God says, I have more for you. You are made in my image. You're my son. You're my daughter. You're worthy of dignity. You're worthy of love. You're worthy of respect. You're worthy of commitment. You're worthy of honor. You're worthy of somebody checking in with you and on you, you're worthy of that because you're my son, you're my daughter, you're my image bearer. 
But when you do, when you inverse it and you go body, soul, then spirit, you set yourself up for abuse and you rinse and repeat. And you date the same person in a different body. And you've given him two years, you gave a dude before him a year and a half, you gave a girl before her one year, you gave a woman for, for that six months, and you're adding up all of this wasted time to when you stop believing that commitment is possible. Am I talking to anybody today? So he says you're one with body and spirit. I love Dr. Michael Heiser. He says this, in the eternal afterlife with God, believers will have the same sort of body that Jesus had after the resurrection. We will identify with the risen Jesus bodily as we identify with the spirit currently. He who is joined to the Lord becomes one with him. In our modern language, we might say that the body Christ had after the resurrection was his earthly body healed and transformed into a material form unbound by the limitations of human terrestrial existence. It was a glorious body. And that's a mouthful, but what he's saying, and when, when Paul says we are one with Jesus, that's what he means. We are one. That's why Paul quotes Genesis 2.24. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and they shall become what? One. Again, this is, this is not to be graphic, family, but, but that the literal act of a man entering a woman, what, what God says is that physical act has spiritual implications. And so they are literally connected. They're one body. During that act, and he's saying it points to something deeper than just the physical act. Why would you do that repeatedly with someone who doesn't want all of you? Why? Why? When we trust Christ as Savior, we are one with him. We're part of his body. That's why Ephesians 1.22, and he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. Romans 12.5, in the same way, we who are many are one body. Where? In Christ and individually members of one another. When you have sex outside of God's parameters, and you're a Christian, let me just be clear, Christians do fall into this. We're not questioning your salvation. But he's saying when a Christian does this, the Holy Spirit is witnessing. You have an eyewitness. And he's not watching as in pornography. He's not watching to be aroused. He's watching and he's grieved. That's what he's saying. He's he's grieved when he watches. C.S. Lewis says it this way, each time a man and a woman enter into a sexual relationship, a spiritual bond is established between them, which must be, watch this, eternally enjoyed or eternally endured. Here's C.S. Lewis's point. When you do it outside of God's parameters, it becomes task-oriented. You endure it. You no longer enjoy it. And notice, I just got to deal with this theologically. Notice the text says the body. Family, let me help you out. There's no scriptural support for soul ties. Okay? But Pastor Gay, he said he was joined. No, he, he, he preceded that in the Greek with the body, the Greek word soma. Now, now Pastor Gay, why are you coming against soul ties? Because it, it doesn't leave room for deliverance if I got spirits from somebody who I slept with uh, 10 years ago still in me. Yeah. That, that's not what the Bible says. The Holy Spirit evicts those yeah. permanently. Amen? Amen? So here's Paul's advice. Flee... Sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you whom you have from God? Here it is. You are not your own. 
For you were brought at a price, so glorify God with your body. So what is Paul's counsel? Run. For some reason, I saw that little Instagram thing when it's like, run, doom, 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 and it goes to this music. But, but he's like, run. Run. Run in the Greek means run. It means to, it means to, to, to get away. This is the same advice. Remember Proverbs, Proverbs 5, 8. Keep your way from, far from her. Don't go near the door of her house. What is he saying? Listen, don't flirt. Because if you flirt with him or her, you're going to go over the edge. You got to know your sexual triggers. That's why Proverbs 6, 27. Can a man embrace fire and his clothes not be burned? But, but, but can, can you, listen, we have to be honest with our sex drive. We have to be honest about that. Proverbs 6 is addressing sexual sin. Listen, uh, by God's grace, my wife and I made it, but that doesn't mean, and I share this part of our story, we were sexually immoral. We didn't have sex, but we were still sexually immoral because it's not just the act. But I thank God we did not live together because he, here's what I know about, you know, Pastor Gay, before Pastor Gay is Pastor Gay, but even as Pastor Gay, I, I, it don't take much for me. Now, now some of y'all can't handle that level of transparency, but Paul, it, it doesn't take much for me. I love my wife. I love her body. Before we were married, I can't be living in the house and then she walking out the shower, got the towel, and she walking by, then the towel just curving her behind and right behind. I can't handle that. I, I can't handle that. I'm going to want to have sex. Since I know this about myself, I got to leave your house by this time. We're not going to live together. We're not going to do this because I want to honor God. And I love you, and I'm, I'm deeply attracted to you. And listen, I have lust for you, but it's not the time because we're not married. I do lust for your body, but, but there's no commitment. So, so I need to honor you, but I got to first honor him. I know it doesn't take much for me to be ready because my wife fine. Guess what? She was fine when we, when we weren't married. Sexual attraction is normal, but it has a time and it has a place. So Paul says to flee. Listen to me. We think we can handle the consequences, but we can't. If you don't run from them, you're going to run in them. Joseph ran. Genesis 39, 11 and 12. Joseph had an older woman looking at him. He had a nice body. The Bible describes his body. He had a nice body, and part of his wife was like, hmm. And she saw him out there working and sweat hitting his brow and his body was glistening and she tried to get him and he had integrity. But then she kept trying and she grabbed him. And what did he do? Run. Doom, 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 doom. He ran. Listen to me. If you're in this situation and you're watching or you're here, I need you to hear me say this. You don't owe them an explanation you owe God your devotion. So how do I flee? Great question. Five things. Be honest with yourself about your sexual triggers. That's number one. Number two, be specific with your partner about your boundaries. You're dating somebody, pray. If both of y'all love the Lord, praise God. Honor God during your dating phase. Number three, be accountable with others in order to succeed. Let people know what time it is. Back then, I, I told these brothers I was discipling, and I said, look, man, I'm going over to Crystal's house. Man, hit me up. We had cell phones. Look, if I don't hit you back by this time, boom, but this is where we're going to be at. Boom, boom, boom. Number four, be willing to break up if they refuse to honor God. Oh, no amens. No amens. Be willing to break up because you don't owe them an explanation. You owe God your devotion. Number five, be ready and willing to run. 
Why? You got to beat your body into submission. Paul said it this way, so I do not run like one who runs aimlessly or box like one beating the air. Instead, I discipline my body. I bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. We'll end here. What happens when you don't run? Watch this, Proverbs 5, verse 14. Now, remember he said, verse 8, Proverbs 5, verse 8, he said, stay away from her house. Verse 9, he says, here's what happens if you don't stay away from his or her house. Watch this, verse 9. Otherwise, you will give up your vitality to others, your years to someone cruel. Verse 10, strangers will drain your resources and your hard-earned pay will end up in a foreigner's house. At the end of your life, you will lament when your physical body has been consumed, and you will say how I hated discipline, how my heart despised correction. I didn't obey my teachers or listen closely to my instructors. I am on the verge of complete ruin before the entire community. Okay, you ain't get it. Here it is. This is just some. This is not an exhaustive list. Some of the consequences. Number one, verse 9 from Proverbs 5, wasted sexual vitality. You give your best sexual years to people who don't care about you. It says you give your vitality to cruel people. You keep experimenting. You keep doing what you want to do sexually. He says you, you, you're wasting your best sexual years, your sexual vitality. You, you're, you're giving it up. You're giving your emotional and sexual vitality to cruel people. Verse 10. Verse 10, it says, man, listen up. Strangers will drain your resources. You know what that is? Turn to your neighbor and say child support. No, say it. Say, say, turn your neighbor, say child support. Solomon predicted this thousands of years ago. Now, I'm going to read it. Strangers will drain your resources and your hard-earned pay will end up in a foreigner's house. Child support. Now, listen, you need to pay it. That's the balance. If it's your child, you need to pay it. But the consequence of sexual sin, I've had brothers say, man, Pastor, man, she didn't, she didn't sow the, uh, the, the child support at the pastor's feet. Can I help you, sister? Sow your child support into your child. Verse 11, regret. How did I get here again? How did I fall for that same talk game again? How did I, how did I, how did I, how did I, verse 11, STDs. Verse 12, depression. He says, how I hated discipline. Verse 13, rejection. I did not obey my teachers. You heard the sermon and you just turned past the gay You heard the man. I ain't trying to hear that because I'm grown. Remember, all things are permissible, but not all things. Yeah, you grown. All things are permissible, but not all things are permissible. I ain't trying to hear that, Pastor Gay. I'm going to watch somebody else. Let me watch somebody that's going to make me feel good. But you got a whole bunch of options, so you can just click me off. How I hate it. I ain't want to hear that. You, You reject it. And then verse 15. I'm sorry, verse 14. Embarrassment. I'm on the verge of ruin in front of the entire community. What happened? Y'all was posting this together and... And listen, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. Uh, Remember, I want to confront, not to condemn, but to convince you that Jesus' way is better. Now, you might feel it and you feel like I'm talking about you. I am if it's you. But it's not me, it's the Holy Spirit. But he he says, you know how you end? Embarrassed, because now you got to keep explaining what happened. Are you hearing me? Listen, I know some of you, and this is just me flowing in what the Lord revealed to me, some of you, since COVID, if you're honest, you've been getting it in, getting it in with your boyfriend. By getting it in, for those who don't, I mean sex, outside of marriage with your boyfriend and your girlfriend, you've been having your COVID sex flings. You've been doing your thing. Listen to me, listen to me. And for some of you, you're afraid to come back because of the shame. Guess what? There's room for you at his table. We're never going to condemn you here. I just told you I had, a, I had a porn addiction while I was married. Who am I to self-righteously judge? But that doesn't mean that we remove God's standard. So listen to me. Come on back. Some of you, you need to be here in person because shame is keeping you from being here. And that's not from God. Yes, you did it. You had sex. You, you've been getting it in. You can overcome your sexual sin. The 
level, the playing field is level at the foot of the cross. When we keep sleeping with people, right? It's like, I know it's hard to see, it's like a little piece of tape, right? And, you know, the more and more I put it and the different partners I have, the adhesive begins to fade away. And that's how some of you are right now. This is how you feel about commitment. This is how you feel about because you don't have any stick left. You, you just feel like, man, it's just, it didn't work out again. It didn't work out again. And Pastor Gay just said, you know, I was posting stuff, and now we done broke up, and now I feel embarrassed. I feel bad, and I don't feel like explaining it. And yes, I did. I, I, we slept together. And, and you see little fragments of my black shirt all on this. But, but here's the beautiful thing about the gospel. God, God, God says this. God says this. I love God because he says, even though they won't stick to you, I will. And my tape is bigger, so I cover the mistakes you made. I cover your body count. I cover your past. I cover your flashbacks. I cover it. And if they won't stick to you, I will. So come to me because there's room and there's grace and there's forgiveness and there's acceptance and there's love at the foot of the cross. He says, I'll take you back. No matter how many times you did it, I'll take you back because you're covered by grace. Our bodies exist to glorify God. Sound familiar? Because if I don't master my desires, my desires will master me. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we're grateful for this time, Jesus, that you, you, you've exposed. And we, we, we shouldn't feel bad about that. We shouldn't, we, we should say, you, you love us enough to expose us to get us back on track. You love us enough to expose us, to remind us that there's room and there's grace at your table. You love us enough to draw us back. You're not trying to get us back. We're grateful and we're thankful, Jesus. So family, I don't, you know, we, we always have a time of response. First and foremost, if you don't know Jesus, remember, it's spirit, soul, body. We want to give you an opportunity to trust him right now. On our website, you'll see an opportunity pop up for you to, for you to trust Christ. Just right where you are, you can believe you're a sinner in need of grace. And if you did that, we would love for you to contact us. We want to walk with you and explain discipleship. We want to give you our B1, make one tool so you can know what your next steps are. But for those of you that are believers, if you're honest, you've fallen into it. But let me tell you, you didn't fall too far to where you're out of Jesus' reach. No matter how deep in the ditch of sexual darkness you feel, his arm can reach you. And he wants to. He doesn't want to make fun of you. He doesn't want to condemn you. He doesn't want to point at you and laugh. And so I want to free you right now to know that, yes, you did it, but there's still grace for you. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if that's you, would you, if you're bold enough, stand. But if you don't feel comfortable, that's cool, too. I'm going to pray for you either way. Some of you at home, if you feel led, just put your hands in the comments, and I want to pray with you and for you. But if you don't put your hand, I'm still going to pray for you either way. No coercion here. Father, you see your people, whether standing or lifted hands, and some just are sitting and contemplating. I pray that they are reminded of your love for them. that their sexual brokenness is not beyond your power to heal and to mend and to set free. I pray that they will cry out to you now. And I pray that you will restore. You are a God who loves us, who draws us to yourself, and who redeems us. Thank you, Jesus. Pray they can feel your presence now. Believers, can, we can fall into anything, but we
we don't fall out of the realm of your grace. And for that, we are eternally thankful. We mess up repeatedly. Repeatedly. But your grace loves and pursues us. So we're thankful. I pray that you would console and comfort those that feel ashamed to come back. Let them know there's no self-righteous judgment here. Let them come on back. We're ready with open arms, just as you are, Christ. God, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.